Welcome to the August 24th edition of the Selectman's Meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, public announcements, Mike, did you have anything? I have nothing tonight. Jim? Nothing tonight. Alex? No, I don't. I have one. It's not even from myself. This is from Chief Nuttall. Chief Nuttall um, would like to provide a brief report of the actions of a member of the general public and three advocate fire department members who were responsible for saving a life on early morning of Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. Around midnight, while investigating a fire alarm activation at 10 Railroad Street, after fire crews and myself were verbally alerted by a member of the public who wishes to remain anonymous, of a vehicle struck on the railroad tracks in Burke Street with an oncoming train approaching. With no time to react or properly notify the MBTA to stop the train, after the firefighters Derek Carmarty and Mike Colajay, followed by Captain George Gardner, began to sprint in full firefighting gear towards the Burke Street crossing to reach the vehicle at a considerable distance. Firefighter Hermione was the first to approach, but was outpaced by the train, which was traveling at a high rate of speed. Firefighter Hermione noticed the passenger vehicle driver outside of her car, apparently confused, and was able to direct her away from the tracks enough to avoid being struck, just as the train passed her. Her vehicle was struck, but fortunately she was not injured. Firefighter Colajay was able to visually notify the train engineer to begin the stopping process by waving his flashlight in the correct manner possibly reduce an impact. We then ran to the front of the stop train close to the Plymouth Street crossing to check on the condition of the engineer and the train. Captain Gardner entered the last passenger car and assessed all passengers and train personnel for injuries, of which none were reported. I took, which is Chief not all, took overall command of the incident and was able to witness their actions directly. There is no doubt, had, had they not been alerted to the vehicle on the tracks, and our personnel rushed over verbally to alert the driver to move from her vehicle as well as to begin to slow down the train. The incident would have had a very different outcome. Chief Hunter wants to recognize and thank the actions of all the people previously mentioned as well as their professionalism. Captain truly is a highly trained, experienced, and capable members of the department working 24 hours a day to keep all of us safe. I'm proud of their efforts, which were able to be witnessed firsthand. So, Great job, Mike. Derek, if you're listening, great job. Yeah, we had a great story from the police department at our last meeting to share, and just another reminder of the great men that protect us while we sleep early on a Sunday morning. And women, not. Thank you. Men and women, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'll issue a formal apology to Derek. <laughs> Mike Milberg. Okay, um, so first up on our written agenda is public hearings, none of which will start until 7 15. So we're going to go down to the action discussion items. And the first one is to vote to approve the minutes of August 10th, 2020. So I'll give you a second to go through those and I'll let it All those in favor of approving the minutes of August 10th, say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Minutes are approved. Um, second action item is a request to appoint Paul Ferris as Democratic Registrar of Voters. Um, well, we have to have one Democrat, one Republican. Is that what we do? And then, I know they, they requested that we yeah. appoint a Democrat. Yeah. So I'll make that motion. Any discussion? All those in favor of appointing Paul Ferris, say aye. 
Number three was discussion on town meeting, and number four was the town manager report. So, style and it'll be even in the both of them. Okay, uh, as you recall, the board voted at our last uh, meeting to open the warrant for a special town meeting on October 19th, 2020. As of today, um, as we're forming this warrant, um, there will be probably three or four budget articles. We're going to have two or three road acceptance articles. And those will, will require us to have a public hearing with, with this board uh, prior to them uh, going to town meeting. Uh, and then there are six zoning articles that we had pulled off from uh, the annual town meeting for you know reasons of keeping it expeditious that I think we can put back on and take care of that. So I would expect to have a draft uh, to the board prior to our next meeting so you can review it. And our intentions will be to close the warrant um, by September on, probably in the meeting of September 28th. Um, so that's that's about it. Just wanted to reiterate that, you know, we, we, there was a vote and we have uh, a warrant open now. Um, going into my report, um, I'm gonna give you an update. We have, as you know, there's um, several paving projects that are going on. And I can, I'm sure everybody noticed the one on Plinowitz Way. So just a review of that, I had asked John Stone because obviously a lot of this was approved um, quite a while back, um, but I had some questions on it. So the Board of Selectmen voted to adopt the complete streets policy that uh, John had drafted back in um, 2018. Policy was approved by the state and uh, was actually given a high score of 94 out of 100. Town was awarded a technical assistant grant through the state in the amount of $36,700. Uh, with that, they got a consultant and they created a prioritized list of 30 projects in town that to qualify for funding. The state chose this particular um, Lincoln Boulevard, Glenowitz Way, she had used pedestrian bike path from the list. They awarded a grant for just under $400,000 to complete the project. The shared use path will begin at the high school and extend down to the corner of Washington. Um, they'll also be tightening up on the south side of Lincoln Boulevard. So uh, we had met, or John and, and the department has met with Sionis. Um, they changed a few things to help um, fit into their needs. Uh, they did at one time uh, a few months ago, I don't know if anybody remembers when, um, right around the time I started, uh, they set up some cones to sort of show what that traffic flow would be like and what it would end up looking like. Uh, they did do a traffic study uh, to see that, you know, make sure that the, the end result would not cause any congestion out onto uh, Route 18. And uh, John said that there's zero local tax dollars. This is all being funded by those, those grants. Uh, the other projects that you've probably noticed is we um, have a binder course over here at Town Hall in, in the worst area that we had of the parking lot. And they did start the senior center. I believe the binder course was going down on that project uh, today or tomorrow. And with the hopes of uh, the final course and the final coach being done, uh, hopefully um, by the end of the month. Uh, early voting is taking place, as everybody is aware. Uh, the hours are running the, uh, tomorrow through Thursday from 8.30 to 4.30 and Friday from 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, we want to remind anybody who's coming to Town Hall is that you know, have to remember to wear a mask, uh, prepare to follow the state guidelines for social distancing. And if you don't feel well, um, please uh, you know, stay home. There are other options that are available to you. I did get a message from Leanne, Leanne Adams, our town clerk. Um, and her update is, uh, as of today, the town clerk's office is processed 2,339 early voted ballots and 292 absentee ballots. Uh, this voting season has many questioning the early absentee voting process. Um, we go to the post office daily and have a very good relationship with them. Uh, they keep adding to ballots in-house for faster delivery. So in other words, they're not, the ballots aren't going to Brockton, they're going from the post office straight back and forth. So it, 
they have been working very well uh, with the town. Um, often the ballots that are, ma are mailed are received by the voter the very next day. You may mail your ballot back to us or we'll use the box outside uh, the front door of the town hall. Uh, you may call or email the office at any time to talk to any, um, any one of our voting questions you may have. Uh, if you're curious if we received your ballot or application, please call. We'll tell you when it was mailed and received. Primary day is September 1st, um, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Emerald Hall, where we did our last election. This is a primary. If you are not in a party, you will need to tell the checker what ballot you want. We have four ballot choices this year. Democrat, Republican, Green Rainbow, and Libertarian. Um, again, call or email me in if you have any questions or concerns. Voting is a privilege, and we take it very seriously here. So, um, like I said, you can, you can go online, you can get through to uh, Lee Ann's office through email or phone call or stop in. So, so another thing that we're working on, um, as I mentioned, we started the process, or initiated the process of updating the personnel policies. Um, and the process is that um, working with our Labor Council, the updated policies first will be reviewed in the draft form by myself with Labor Council. Uh, and then we send the draft policies to the unions uh, to see if they need to be impact bargained. That's by statute. Once the policies are finalized, including any revisions from impact bargaining, then we'll bring them to the Board of Selectmen for the, a review. Um, you know, if the Board of Selectmen does not veto the policies or have any issues with the policies, then they become effective on the 15th day after they're presented to the Board. So the policies that we, we've initiated so far is we've started the um, travel policy, which obviously um, is just going to be in effect until such time as the COVID emergency ends. Um, but we are also uh, initiating a vehicle use policy, electronic use policy, and code of conduct. So those are all in the works. We, you know, again, we have to get them out to all the departments that are affected just to see what the revisions or what sort of effect this will have on it. Um, MRI management study implementation. So I have been advised by Chief Pajensky that he has authorized Deputy Chief Cutter to begin the process of implementing the recommendations of the MRI management study. To that end, I have requested and received an implementation outline from the Deputy Chief. Um, I'll share the outline with the board and place it on a future agenda, I think it's probably the September 14th meeting. Uh, in the meantime, many of the tax have already uh, been implemented. Uh, and additionally, it is important to note that the deputy chief is in the midst of the reaccreditation process. Uh, the department must undergo this every few years. Uh, requires a significant amount of time, documentation. Um, they work with third parties for you know, verification and scoring. So uh, they do have a lot going on, but he is, uh, like I said, it, it is a fairly uh, good schedule that he has forwarded to me. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you guys and uh, getting going on that. Uh, town manager's corner. So, uh, taped a couple of segments already. I just did a, one with the library a couple weeks ago, and hopefully Abington Cable will have that up and running pretty soon. Uh, this week, I'll be meeting with uh, John Stone over at the DPW and Susan DeGisberg over at the Senior Center. I'm going to record a couple more episodes. And again, this is a, you know, an attempt for me to get out and let everybody know, you know who the different departments are, the different department heads, what they're doing, and what sort of programs we have going on and you know, how it's going to affect it. That is my manager's report. Thank you. Um, so at this time, with our first public hearing being 7.15 and being just short of a half an hour away from that, I'll entertain a motion to recess until that time, since we cannot legally start any earlier. I would make that motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Right. We'll be recessed till 7 15.
listening notice. So this is, so maybe you can give some background better than I can on this, or we can go right to this. But the um, Community Resilience Building Workshop Summary, so this was some workshops that were held um, previously. Do you want to explain or shop? Yeah. I'll jump right into it. So good evening. I'm Liz Sher with the Planning Board, and this is our consultant for our MB MVP grid. It's Bob Hartzell. He's going to give the presentation tonight. Just a tiny bit of background. I applied for and we obtained an MVP grant, which is a municipal vulnerability grant. And it is uh, about climate resiliency, and the state has grant a lot of grant money available to help um, cities and towns with that. So we applied for, we were granted $17,000. Bob came in, we held several workshops, we had um, a bunch of different department heads um, in these workshops and people from the community and we worked together over Zoom because <laughs> of course it happened during the pandemic. But we actually put together a really decent list of what the town's vulnerabilities are um, and a priority list of um, those vulnerabilities that we can apply to the state for them and hopefully get some grant money to come and start helping correct them. So no further ado, I'll let Bob do his show. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Liz. Um, so Liz gave a good overview of uh, why we're here to sort of publicly present the findings of this planning grant. And I guess I, I know you've got a packed agenda tonight and we've got about 15 minutes, so I'll just jump right into it. But uh, preface it by saying that this listening session is a required part of the, uh, the grant. It's sort of the last piece of the, uh, the grant project. So getting these um, findings out there to the public and having a venue for the public to respond and provide comments is, is part of that. So um, I'll just jump ahead. So this presentation uh, will take about 15 minutes and will provide an overview of the MVP um, program, uh, climate change projections for Abington, and a summary of the planning grant results and next steps. So the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant Program, or, or the MVP program, uh, provides support for cities and towns in Massachusetts to begin the process of planning for climate change resiliency and also implementing priority projects. Uh, the state awards communities with funding to complete vulnerability assessments and to develop action-oriented resiliency plans. Uh, communities uh, such as yours who complete the program become certified as an MVP community and are eligible for MVP action grant funding and other funding opportunities. And that's really the whole point of this is to, you know, this small planning grant tees the town up to get um, the much larger pot of money that's now available to you. And we'll talk more about that. Um, the program was funded uh, by the 2018 Environmental Bond Bill, which included over $200 million for uh, funding for climate change adaptation. So the MVP program steps are to first obtain a planning grant, which was explained and what you did, um, to s next complete a workshop and write a summary of findings, which we're here to talk about tonight. And then as soon as that's completed, you become a state uh, certified MVP community. Over the last three years, over three quarters of the states, uh, cities and towns have participated in this program and uh, funding for the program has exceeded over $17 million to date. The most recent action grant round, that's the step that follows this, that the action grants, uh, in the fall of 2019 funded over 50 projects throughout the state for a total of over $10 million. So the MVP program funds many project types. And when I say the program, that, that I'm really talking about the action grants that will follow. Um, it funds many project types designed to increase resiliency relative to potential climate change impacts. The most common types are more detailed vulnerability assessments. So you may know that you have flooding on a road, but you don't quite know how to fix it. You don't, you don't have the engineering done yet. So those types of more detailed assessments. Um, it funds redesigns and retrofits to rebuild existing infrastructure. For example, to increase the size of a culvert to pass larger flood flows. And also nature-based solutions for flood protection, drought mitigation, and water quality improvements. Uh, there are many other eligible project types. For example, the program was expanded in 2019 to include energy resiliency projects such as installation of solar panels on the roofs of uh, public buildings to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So now we'll give a quick overview of some climate change projections that drive the MVP program. Over the last 50 to 100 years, the Massachusetts climate has been changing. 
We've seen increases in temperature and associated changes to the growing season, sea level, and heavy precipitation events. For example, the average temperature across the state has increased by almost three degrees Fahrenheit since 1895. Climate change projections for Massachusetts can be found at resilientma.org, which is the state's website uh, which provides interactive tools to uh, explore, explore data related to climate change. Based on these projections, it's expected that the average temperature and rainfall may continue to significantly increase here in Plymouth County. For example, uh, the average temperature is expected to increase by almost 5 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100, and rainfall is expected to increase by 2.5 inches per year. So what does that mean? Uh, to put those projections into perspective, this figure shows how temperatures in Massachusetts are changing and have been changing based on several uh, climate change scenarios. Under the worst case conditions, the average temperature for Massachusetts could be similar to that of South Carolina by the year 2100. The lower greenhouse gas emission scenario would project temperatures similar to that of Delaware. And as you can see in this figure, the temperatures have already started shifting from 1990 to present, where sort of compared to 1990, <coughs> we're more positioned, you know, close to the, uh, the climate of what Connecticut was in 1990. So the potential consequences of climate change are widespread, and these include increases in flooding, increases in health-related pests such as ticks and mosquitoes, and more frequent extreme weather events. So one key piece of the town's MVP planning grant was to hold a workshop. And typically, this is an all-day in-person workshop. But due to COVID-19 limitations, the workshop was split into two web-based virtual meetings following the protocols outlined by the state. The goal of the workshop was to have community stakeholders uh, work together and complete a climate change and natural hazard vulnerability assessment and to develop prioritized actions to address these vulnerabilities and also to improve on strengths that the town currently has. Uh, the workshop was based on the Community Resiliency Building Program developed by the Nature Conservancy. And you can find more information about that program at communityresiliencebuilding.com, which is the link uh, at the bottom of that slide. The workshop was broken into three primary exercise, ex exercises to first identify the town's top climate related hazards, second to identify the town's strengths in areas of concern such as specific undersized pipes or maybe a, a dam that might be at risk of failing, and finally to identify specific actions to address those concerns that could be funded with action grants. So the MVP workshop was conducted as these two meetings on May 12th and May 19th, 2020. And the town efforts in planning the workshop were led by a core team uh, as listed here. The workshop was attended by 11 stakeholders as well as the state's MVP coordinator for the region. So as I mentioned, the first uh, exercise was to identify the town's top climate related hazards. And the town selected flooding, strong storms, and drought and extreme temperatures as the top three climate related hazards. Strong storms is kind of a broad term that includes a variety of storm types, including rain, snow, high winds, and ice storms. And this is a really tough slide to see, but everyone is supposed to, I guess, squeeze one of those into every presentation. So this is just to kind of give a sense of how this workshop process flowed. So first, um, the uh, participants identified the top hazards up there, which I know you can't read, but those are the ones I just listed. The next step was, which was to fill out that left-hand column over here, which was to identify areas of concern and also strengths that the, the town had um, related to climate change. And the final exercise is that big chunk over to the right was to actually populate specific actions. So if you were concerned about flooding as a major concern, th then it was, okay, where are we having flooding and what specifically can we do about it? What do we need to rebuild? What do we need money for? So now we've got this list of actions that have been prioritized specific to Abington. So now I'm gonna uh, run down the top concerns related to infrastructure. So with regard to dams, um, dams requiring repair due to flooding and, and damage from high peak flows include Beaverbrook Dam, Island Grove, Pond Dam, and Hunts Brook Dam. Uh, for bridges, the Central Street Bridge requires repair associated with flooding uh, and high flows. And this has been identified by the state as a significant hazard bridge in a recent inspection. Uh, road flooding. Flooding of roads due to low points or proximity to surface water uh, is an issue in several spots, including Chestnut Street, Ashland Street, 
uh, under Route 123 and also Shaw Avenue. Ice buildup. Um, the work workshop participants identified that ice buildup on roads was increasing uh, in the winter due to increased use of sump pumps. So it's kind of a multiple things going on there. You have the more intense and more frequent rain events that are forcing people into using their sump pumps and this is then during the cold months freezing up on the roads and leading to safety issues. And finally, water supply. Um, the water supply for the town is considered a vulnerability because it's, uh, it comes from Great Sandy Bottom Pond through a single pipe. So that means if there was something to happen to that pipe or if the supply from that pond became uh, at risk, your water supply is not very resilient. So top concerns related to uh, society included vulnerable populations, uh, senior housing facilities are vulnerable to extreme heat and impacts from power outages, including the senior housing here on Glenowitz Way. The town's emergency alert system uh, is considered to be quite good, but it, uh, it was acknowledged that it's not available to all populations. So the Nixle system requires that citizens obtain information from the town website, and there needs to be a, a broader way to get information out rather than forcing people to come in. Uh, critical facilities with one egress. So these are areas that might be at risk, say, during an extreme storm event, if a tree was to come down and block the roadway. Um, there's, you know, some of these facilities are critical and, and would need to have a second way of getting people in and out. So the senior housing facilities have one egress um, and are in flood prone areas and that may impede emergency access, uh, ambulances and so on, uh, access to getting people out to shelters. And other critical town facilities included here, the town offices right here, the emergency shelter at Abington High School, uh, which also only have one egress. And then finally, air conditioning at public schools. Uh, two element elementary schools are not air conditioned and Abington High School is not fully air conditioned. It does have a cooling system, but not a full air conditioning system. And they're vulnerable to periods of extreme heat, which are going to be more frequent. Uh, the top concerns in the, uh, concerns in the final category of environmental included uh, phosphorus loading, nutrient enrichment um, for Island Grove Pond, leading to more frequent, more um, severe uh, algal blooms and other nuisance conditions, uh, and uh, increased uh, nuisance vegetation. Erosion and tree loss was an issue uh, associated with flooding and strong storms in the Island Grove area, and also the potential for loss of trees due to uh, damage from the Woolia Delgid, which is expected to increase in its population uh, as the climate warms. Um, there is an increased wildfire risk due to drought and extreme temperatures and the, uh, the wooded Carista property in the northeastern part of town was noted as a particular uh, property of risk. And then finally, risk of property damage due to drought or flooding, um, in particular the Strawberry uh, Valley Golf Course was considered a, an economic uh, loss risk. So a couple of strengths that the town has, um, cooling stations. There are multiple town-owned properties that already uh, are used by the town as cooling stations during heat events. And you've got a town-owned pool and senior center. So these are, these are things that help you become, you know, that help you with your resiliency to heat changes. Um, and overall, the town has good tree canopy uh, throughout the town. So now we're just gonna quickly go over the top three recommended actions. So these would be the ones that would be sort of at the top of the list to get funding um, if the town chooses to uh, apply for action grants. So number one was repair of the Island Grove Pond Dam. So the issue here uh, first would be to uh, further assess, get a, a more detailed engineering assessment uh, to build upon uh, what's already been done in a recent emergency action plan to get uh, more information related to climate resiliency built into that. Uh, do a little more modeling to project into the future uh, so that the design is resilient for years to come. Uh, this could include additional dam inspections, engineering assessments, and flood modeling um, for higher intensity storms. And then the second step of that is to simply take the money that you'd get from a grant and repair. And that would include engineering feasibility analysis, permitting, engineering design, and the actual construction. Second was to evaluate the senior center as a shelter and also provide a backup generator. So the issue here is that the senior center currently is used as a cooling station only during the day during extreme heat events. Um, it does not have the capacity for uh, overnight because a backup generator is not there to provide power in the case of a power outage during um, an extreme event. 
So the solution is to get you know, funding and install a backup generator with clean energy technology <laughs> that has no greenhouse gas emissions. The reason for that is uh, if you were to get funding for this, uh, gas generators are not fundable. So they, there are other technologies out there called Black Start or photovoltaic battery storage that um, no greenhouse gas emissions and they will they'll pay you to do that. <laughs> Um, and also to assess the feasibility of facility improvements needed to provide overnight housing during heat waves or other emergency. And that's everything from having cots and blankets and all the things that you'd need to keep people overnight. And finally, uh, the number three action was to repair the Central Street Bridge. The problem here is that it, it has been identified as a significant hazard during a recent inspection and that with climate change we're going to have more frequent and more severe flood conditions and more and higher peak flow rates that are going to further put that, um, that bridge at, at risk. So expand upon the current assessment to include climate resiliency risks for those bigger peak flows and uh, more intense events and then use uh, action grant funding to rehabilitate the bridge based on those recommendations. We're in a very quick just uh, run through other high priority actions. So those top three ones that I mentioned, you're not in any way beholden to apply for grant funding for those first. You can take any action item that's in this report and you could apply for that as you could just decide tomorrow that that's the town's number one priority. So you're not in any way held to this. So a real quick run through the other priority actions are to conduct a further assessment of Beaverbrook Dam and repair as necessary conduct a study to determine climate related risks to the town's water supply and actions to uh, improve resiliency related to climate change, uh, to install air central air conditioning and a backup generator with clean energy technology at the senior housing here on Glenowitz Way and Shaw Ave, conduct a feasibility study to evaluate options for a second emergency egress to town properties uh, here at Town Hall, and to implement nutrient loading reduction measures and other algae control measures for Island Grove Pond as recommended in a recent study. So the next steps um, now that this study is completed is to submit uh, the final report uh, including any feedback from this listening session tonight and at that, at that point the town is now an MVP designated community by the state um, and then you can start to implement those recommendations that we talked about tonight so really it's just a question of um, you know Liz or others on that committee deciding, you know, if you want to apply for a grant in the next action round, uh, which would probably be next spring. And in terms of public feedback to this listening session tonight, there is a feedback survey link that's up here on this slide. And also all of the documents that we've referenced, the, the report and this uh, presentation and all the links that are embedded within it are available uh, on the town website. And um, for me? Yes. <laughs> So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I was at least close to 15 minutes and keeping you on schedule. Yeah, plus or minus a few. You did. Any questions from the board? Just how often are the grants available? Is this a yearly basis? Yeah, it's, so the program's been running since 2017, and in the first, I think, two or three years, up until last year, they were doing the action grants twice a year. And it looks like this year they've kind of shifted to a once a year basis, but that is subject to change. Um, it's been a top priority for the Baker administration since it started, but um, with COVID and all the funding changes for a lot of agencies, um, mm -hmm. I think right now the, the understanding is at least once per year. So when is the deadline? Uh, it year? would be most likely around you know, late spring, like in, in May I of uh, 2020. So we should start preparing uh, for next spring now. And, and the, um, the, our regional representative, um, emails us all the time, not only about the things that are happening with this, but other grant opportunities. So I try to forward those to the um, departments that they belong to, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll have plenty of notice of when the application deadline opens and when it closes. I think that's so it's a good idea to have a, a good couple of months of lead time because you know, you're going to have to have a little bit of back and forth figuring out right. what kind of match right. the town might be able to provide and wh whether it's cash or in-kind services. So a few months is about right. I think the uh, priorities that you have identified, uh, I'm not speaking for the board, but we've actually been discussing uh, those issues uh, this summer. So I think um, if any way we could get grants for that, it would be great next year. Anybody from public have questions? 
Okay, well, we'll leave the, uh, the online survey open for as long as, as you want, and I'll just communicate with Liz about when we can decide to call it done, and then we'll just get the final report into Great. the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Street, our nuisance or dangerous dogs. Um, so we're going to open this meeting. Greg, do you need to open this like a public hearing? Meeting? So yes, um, Mr. Chair, through before you do, um, we have somebody who needs to dial in by phone. Okay. Um, so can we take care of that before we officially yeah, open the hearing? Do we want to call them? Or they call? Oh. If you can call, your phone's probably better. Yeah. Well, do we have a number to call? Oh, I thought that was like, yeah. The chairman appointed Mr. Alex Bazanson as our telecommunications director. Yeah, we might have to ask Liz how to handle the phone here. It's 904. Liz, you want to um, you show us how to use this phone? Sure. It is my phone. It is your phone, so um, yeah, why don't you uh, get them on there and then we'll put the microphone next to them. Do we have the number? Uh, 904 476 7655 Jim Crawley. Let me just let him know that he's on. Hello, Jim. Okay, Jim, you're on. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. Okay. Hi, Jim. So, Jim, I'm the chairman of the board um, of Slackman here in Abington. Just letting you know that you're on speakerphone here. Um, we're about going to open the uh, public hearing. Okay. So, having that all said, I'll take a motion to open the hearing. I'll make a motion to open a hearing on uh, nuisance and or dangerous dog hearing and today. 24th at 7.15, 7.30, correct? No, second. Any discussion? All in favor of opening the hearing, say aye. 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 Unanimous, hearing's open. So, Greg, did you want to walk us through the procedure? Yes, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Corbo, town council for the town of Abington, and I'll be assisting the board with um, processing this complaint um, based on allegations that um, two dogs are nuisance or dangerous dogs as defined in the Massachusetts general laws. Um, before we get started, um, to members of the board as well as um, members of the public um, here and watching on TV, um, the proceeding will generally proceed in um, three phases. Okay? So during the first phase, you will hear evidence and testimony from the party who made the complaint regarding the subject dogs. Um, this will can be in the form of sworn witness testimony and any documents or photographs that they wish to provide. Um, counsel for the dog owner will have an opportunity to ask any questions through the chair, um, and members of the board and myself will have an op opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, when that testimony is completed, we will ask if there is any testimony from the town's animal control officer. Um, and we'll proceed in much the same way with witness testimony um, and questioning from the various parties. 
Um, once that part of the proceeding is concluded, we'll move on to what I refer to as phase two, which is the dog owner's opportunity to provide their defense. Um, so they can provide any witnesses or documents that they wish to um, in defense of the dogs. And like in the first proceeding, there will be an opportunity for myself, um, for the complainants, and for members of the board to ask questions of the witnesses. And then we'll reach the third and final phase, which is when the board will deliberate and render a decision. Um, the board will be passing on two questions. Um, the first question is whether the dogs are nuisance dogs or dangerous dogs as those terms are defined in the statute. And if the answer to that question is yes, then what if any remedy should be issued um, to abate the nuisance or the danger posed by the dogs? Uh, so it will require a vote on those two questions um, and then the hearing will be concluded. Um, so before we get started, are there any questions about the procedure? Could we get some introductions as to all the players here, uh, this gentleman and uh, who's on the phone with us and everything? Yes, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, first off is the, um, the complainant here. Yes, would you please um, stand and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Gail Bergen. And Ms. Bergen, do you intend on presenting any other witnesses here tonight? No. Okay. Okay, and is the um, animal control officer here? Yeah, Joe Penny. Thank you. Um, and Jeremy, would you like to introduce sure. your side? Jeremy Cohen, representing Karen May, Steve May. Uh, Karen's obviously here. And then the only other person we have is by phone, Jim Crosby. He's our uh, dog bite expert. <coughs> His CV was circulated earlier. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, other question? I don't mean to interrupt, but if you can move the speakerphone, I'm only getting about every third word here. Yeah, they have to go to the mic. They have to go to the mic there, too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, any further questions regarding the procedure? No. Thank you. Anybody from the board? Any questions? Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, Proceed one at a time. If you're giving testimony, I'd ask that you approach the microphone, that you state your full name um, and address for the record, and then that you um, raise your right hand to be sworn. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, can we have Ms. Bergen step up? Hi, my name's Gail Bergen. I live at 71 Morton Street. Thank you, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? I do. Thank you. Um, you may now give your testimony to the board. Okay, I'm, I'm actually just gonna, I wrote out my statement, I'm just gonna read it. Um, it's very emotional for me, so when I tell what happened, but on Thursday, June 4th, 2020, a little after eight o'clock in the morning, I left my house at Morton, 71 Morton Street to go for a walk. And when I got to the end of Morton Street, it's actually Morton Street Extension, it's a, it's a little, and I met Karen and her two dogs, and we said hi to each other. And one dog, a pit bull, ran full tilt at me. I was only a few feet away, and the leash slipped from her grasp. The dog grabbed me by the right ankle, knocked me down, bit my foot through my sneaker. She got the dog off of me. I fell backwards. I was on my back, and as she got the dog off of me, her other dog came over and bit me on the arms, I was on the ground. Um, she got the dogs away, asked me if I was okay, and then I went home. I had a bite on the top of my right foot and on my ankle, and I have a bite on my left armpit area. I called my friend who was a nurse, and she came and gave me first aid. I called, the, I called Joe Kenny, um, I called my doctor's office, and they called me back later and said they wanted me to come in and I had to go in and I got, had to get a tetanus booster and go on antibiotics and they cleaned my wounds and told me how to take care of them. Um, I also scraped my elbow and had kind of a sore tailbone from the fall for a little while. Um, and that was that day. Um, another day I was driving down, the dogs barked and ran at my car. Um, 
I'm afraid to walk out of my house. I can't go anywhere without going by their house. I can't walk anywhere without going by their house. And I'm afraid of meeting the dogs. And also we have a lot of children in the neighborhood and I'm afraid of it happening again to a child. I just would like you to remove the dogs, please. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Bergen. Um, did you um, submit a written I statement did. to the board? Yep. Yes. There's, um, a, there's a written statement and there's some photographs of my bikes. Okay, thank you. And um, members of the board, do you have that written written statement? Thank yes. You. Yes. Okay. And um, ma'am, do you um, agree that the photos that you submitted can be part of the record of this yes. proceeding? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, can we have Mr. Cohen ask if he has any questions? Thank you. Uh, what are the out-of-pocket uh, medical expenses, if any? I have a couple of co-pays and a little, some first aid things. I didn't add them up. It's probably about forty dollars. It's it's not. It wasn't a big monetary loss for me. It's a, an emotional issue with me. And I'm sorry, just when we ask questions, if you could step up to the mic yeah. just for the people watching at home. Sure. And kind of a little social distance mm -hmm. as best we can. Thank you. Do you use my microphone? We have no, uh, no further questions. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, do you have questions? Just a question, when the second dog, do you know where the second dog came from? Yeah, she had them both on a leash. They were both on a leash. Yeah, and they both got away from her. Gotcha. Thank you. Did they break the leash or no. did they delete they, the dog? No, they got away from her. Okay. They didn't, the leash didn't break. They, she let go. And you have a previous relationship with the dog owners? Oh, we're neighbors. It's neighbors. Yeah. Just just friendly. Yeah. yeah. And now, you said the end result, you want to see us remove the dogs. What do you mean I, by I can't. I, I don't know, can, can they be rehomed? I mean, I tell you, my house is behind theirs. I cannot walk anywhere without going by their house. I never know when the dogs are gonna be there. And I'm afraid of that. How long have you lived? Have only have I lived there? Yeah. Since 1996. And how long have they lived there? Um, a few years after that, I don't know when they moved in. They built a house, I don't remember what year. Did they, they have the dogs when they moved in? No, they had a different dog. When did they get these dogs? Roughly, just I, They had. Cinnamon, the second dog that bit me, they've had longer than the other one. They've only had the other one a few years, I think, if that. And what I kind of dog is the second one? I think it's a lab hound mix, but you could ask her. I mean, I don't know what kind of dog it is. Have you ever seen these dogs get this before that? No. Since then? They, the, the dog, the cinnamon, cinnamon, the dog they've had the longest, I mean, they tie it out. They used to tie it out, and it would always run from my car as far as it would go on the leash, on the lead. But I've never seen them loose before, no. Any other questions? I have none. Okay. Um, nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, through you, next up we have um, Animal Control Officer Joe Kenny. Joe Kenny. Um, I was out there on June. Um, Mr. Kenny, I'm sorry. Can we just have you sworn in first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, guys. That's okay. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? I do. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, guys. So I'm Joe Kenny, Animal Control. I was out um, 71, cleverly 44. Um, yeah, that's true. <coughs> I'm sorry. But um, I was out there on June 4th. The dog, I got the call. The dogs had gone loose and um, bitten. Um, so when I got there, the dogs were contained. Um, they had already been, like the wounds had been cleaned up and I ended up quarantining the pit, gray and white pit bull, Murphy. Um, both dogs were up to date on their shots. They were both registered. Um, I hadn't had any other complaints or calls about the dogs. And since then I haven't had anything. Um, there's a, bite to the foot. There was a shoe that prevented it from being anything serious. 
um, and the dogs had knocked it down. So, um, I'm sorry. What's your name again? Gil, Gil Burden. Uh, Gil, Gil Burden. Um, they had knocked down Gil Burden, but other than that, there wasn't too much damage. Um, and the shoulder, we weren't sure at the time what was going on with it. So we ended up quarantining the um, gray and white pit bull, did standard 10 day quarantine, and then the dog was released. I haven't heard anything since then. Um, I heard gotten a second report recently that the dogs had gotten out, and this is how I heard on here. Um, but other than that, I haven't had any calls or anything like that on the dogs. Uh, I, at the time, I actually recommended to the owners that for peace's sake, um, that they muzzled the pit bull when they took it out, um, just to make people feel more comfortable. From my understanding, it had hap been happening since then, um, but like I said, I hadn't had any other calls or anything, so nothing loose, nothing barking, that's it. But did you say you did get one call since then? That they no, I haven't gotten any calls. Um, I got notice that the dogs had uh, charged a car or something um, just prior to this hearing request. But it wasn't a phone call, it wasn't a reported thing. Um, so how did you get the notice? The notice, we, oh no, I got it at the town hall. It came in as a written notice okay. um, or we, with the request of the hearing. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys have a copy of that as well. And do, do you know, can you be more specific about um, what types of dogs these are? So yeah, what so is Murphy? The young, Murphy yeah. um, is the younger pit, pit mix, I think. Um, he's a gray and white, bigger dog. Um, he is relatively young. I think he's been registered for two years, assuming the owners bought him two years ago. Um, the other dog, I think it's Cinnamon, seemed to be like a um, lab kind of mix, um, darker in color, and that dog has been registered with the town for at least four years. And when you went out to do your investigation, did you interact with the dogs? Yes, I did. Um, and I saw both the dogs, and they were acting calm to me. Um, I pet both of them, and that was the extent of it. Um, as part of the quarantine, you got to see the dogs, so um, saw both the dogs, and I didn't have a problem. Um, they didn't try to bite or anything like that. They barked when I went to the door, and that was the extent of the dogs with me. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Cohen, you have any questions? How long after the incident uh, had the animal control officer seen the ducks? Um, it was shortly thereafter, within about an hour. Um, I was as soon as I got the call, I came out, so it was pretty soon after. And this uh, allegation that they charged a car—did you do you know? I didn't deeper? get any calls for it. Okay. Um, I just it, when we got the request for the hearing. It was in that. That's the only other notice I've had. I've had. Okay. And, and aside from what's happened with the Bergens, has there ever been an incident uh, with either dog from no. the Bay House? No, I've not had any other calls on the dogs. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Mr. Chair, are there any questions from you or members of the board? From the board? No. No questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kenny. We're all set. And uh, Ms. Bergen, um, do you have any other uh, witnesses or, or evidence you'd like to present? No. I just, can I say one more thing? Uh, please just approach the I, microphone. Can I just say something? Well, you have to approach the microphone. Sorry, I don't really, I don't have any witnesses. Karen and I are the only ones that witnessed it. Um, I just want to say, like, I had three bites, but it was a vicious. It was horrifying what happened. I was knocked to the ground and bitten by two dogs. It was very, very scary. And I just want you to know that even though my bites are going to heal, it, it's, I, I haven't healed from it. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. OK, so um, as I explained earlier, that, that concludes phase one of the proceeding, which 
um, comprises the complaints against the dogs. Uh, so now um, we can move on to phase two, in which the dog owner has an opportunity to present their defense. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I would uh, turn it over to Attorney Cohen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so an important thing to know here is that uh, the Mays, where they live, they continue to live there for one reason, and it's their 98-year-old neighbor next door who uh, lives alone. Her husband died, I think, in 1965, uh, or when she was 65. She's 98. And uh, they started off carrying, getting her mail, paying her bills, and now they're her only family. If, if she's try, they're trying to keep her aging in place. Once that, uh, her situation changes, they, they plan to move anyway. But I think it's important to know that they, at least on one half, they're, they're good neighbors on, on one side. Uh, tonight, we're asking that the dogs be, de be deemed a nu nuisances. And I, I provided it, but essentially the definition of nuisance can be a dog that attacks, but its, its actions were grossly disproportionate under all of the circumstances. So I think the most important circumstance, which we didn't hear about, is that uh, the parties, they never greeted and said hello. Before the bite, as, um, as our coming up Morton on oh, Beverly. Um, excuse me, Mr. Cohen, through you to the chair. Um, if, if you're gonna have a description of the incident, I think we need to have it from a witness. Okay, so let me just walk us through where we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, you hear testimony that uh, neither party could see each other with the hedges there. So just as Ms. Bergen was startled by my client and the dogs, so was my client uh, startled, and the dogs were startled. A difference now is that she would never walk both dogs at the same time. Uh, so she's agreed, no matter what, to walk one dog per one adult. And you'll hear testimony that uh, the dogs, if they're ever in the yard on a tie-out, are only in the yard on a tie-out with an adult. So they never just left outside. These dogs don't like to be outside that often. And you'll hear from our expert, Jim Crosby. This is important because there are scales of bites, which he'll walk us through briefly. But he's had a chance to look at everything that you've seen up to anything that you were handed today. He knows about the, the dogs running at the car, although they stayed on the leash. He's seen the photos, and he's seen the descriptions. Uh, so. As we're asking that they be deemed nuisance dogs, they be um, mistakes happen. This was a mistake. You'll hear from Karen how sorry she is. She's been trying to pay the bills from the beginning, but obviously they're not that big. But she's offered from from ten minutes after the incident, she was calling her. Um, so at this time, I'd like to have, since we've just heard about the bites, have Jim Crosby. Uh, Jim, can you just introduce yourself, give a brief, brief description of what you do and how long you've been doing it, and just tell us what you saw through the, through the evidence that's been submitted. Um, Mr. Crosby, I don't know if you can hear me, but before you begin, even though we can't see you, I do need to have you sworn in. Okay, I'm, I heard uh, Mr. Cohen ask me to introduce myself. The, the phone on your end, the speakerphone, I'm getting about every fourth word. Whoever the lady was that testified, I missed most of her testimony, and the male voice I heard, I got spotted. So um, I need, I, I'm sorry, and I apologize, but I need whoever's speaking to be closer to that uh, speakerphone so I can hear. Uh, good, good evening, Mr. Crosby. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, my name is Greg Corbo. I'm the attorney for the town of Abington. And you're going to give testimony in this proceeding. Um, but before you do, I would ask that, that you be sworn in. Um, so even though we can't, we can't see you, I'll take your word for it. Um, will you please raise your right hand? I am. Thank you. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? I do. Thank you. I'm now going to turn things over to Attorney Cohen who's going to ask you some questions. Certainly. Jim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. 
Can you just share with us um, what it is that you do? I'll try to boil it down pretty quickly. I am, most of my work is as a uh, expert consultant on dog aggression, dog bites, um, dog bite investigation, dog behavior, uh, the evidence issues and legal issues around that. Uh, for background, I am a certified behavior consultant as certified by the Council for Certification of Professional Dog Trainers. I'm a retired police lieutenant with the Sheriff's Office here in Jacksonville, Florida. I have served as the chief officer of two different animal control agencies here in Florida. As such, I am still a certified animal control officer. Uh, I am a subject matter expert for several organizations such as the National Sheriff's Association and the National Animal Control Association on dog bite investigations and um, dog aggression. I've been accepted in local, state, and federal courts in, I think, 13 or 15 states now and four or five federal uh, uh, districts and heaven knows how many local uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I've also served as an expert in the United Kingdom and the, in Canada and in the Commonwealth of Australia. Excellent. Uh, my Thank speci you. My specialty is fatal dog attacks, and I've investigated more of those than anybody else in the world. Okay. Uh, for t tonight's hearing, can you just tell us what you've reviewed relative yeah, to I've, re I've reviewed the, um, the Massachusetts state law and um, the county ordinances regarding dogs and dangerous dogs. I reviewed the statement, the handwritten statement and map that I was provided by Gail, um, I'm not sure the last name, um, uh, Berger, the person who was bitten. I reviewed photographs of the, the two dog bites, one to the individual's right foot and one to the armpit area, a couple of photographs of the scene and of the <clears throat> exterior of the house. Um, and the uh, animal control uh, reports and information have been, and information have been provided. What can you tell us about um, the bites to the foot? We believe the bites to the foot were, or the echo were from Murphy. What are we okay. looking at? When we look at those pictures, uh, if we have uh, in front of us, as you probably do, the, fr the top one, we're looking at a, a, a mark on the right top foot and then on the right of the right ankle. Correct. I, I'm looking at the photograph and what I see are two puncture or, or apparent puncture defects. Both of them appear to be quite shallow. Uh, the reason for saying that is because the, the puncture wound on the top of the foot is directly over the uh, bones of the tarsals or the, the, the long bones in the foot. Uh, the bite on, or the puncture on the ankle is over the, directly over the, the knobby bone that you have in your ankle. It's called a tarsus. Uh, the skin and muscle in both of those locations is very thin, so a puncture wound that does not cause a medical, medically noted defect to the bone beneath is by definition quite shallow. Uh, this is a minor bite. Uh, on the, according to the scale developed by veterinary behaviorist Dr. Ian Dunbar, which is probably the most widely accepted scale in the world as far as I know and that I've been using and teaching for 20 years. Um, this would be a, what's called a level three bite. That being a bite that involves one to four holes less in depth than half approximately the length of the dog's canine tooth. This bite is consistent with a level three bite, which is the lowest level of bite that involves actual 
breaking the skin. To contrast that, many of the bites I work are level six, which are fatalities. This was a minor single engagement, engage and withdraw, we call it, um, bite. Okay, and before you um, opine on them, I just want to get to the, to the bite uh, under the arm. I, and I just want to make sure, Greg, were you able to circulate the Dunbar? Oh, Scott, did you? I did not see that. Okay, I have a couple. I'll just move around. One second, Jim. Sure. Jim, if you, uh, Jim, are you going to allow the, they should have one of these. Does the person get this piece of paper you can buy? Jim, turning the yeah. page, so turning the page to, um, what's titled left underarm? Yes. Okay. And, uh, you see the same mark in two pictures, right? That is, that is correct. Okay. So this uh, is allegedly from the dog um, Cinnamon, who's a smaller dog. What can you tell us after looking at the descriptions of what happened um, and the, the, the visual of these bites here? What can you tell us about the bite level here? Okay, this is a single engagement, a single bite. If you will look, I'm assuming you're looking at the same two pictures. So if you will look at the photograph that on the, the PDF pages on the upper right, it shows, to orient you, it shows a dark uh, triangular spot towards the bottom right corner. And then about the middle of the image, it shows kind of a semicircular uh, pattern. I can, let me explain that. That is the semicircular pattern are the impressions that did not break the skin from the incisors and canines, most likely of the upper jaw of the dog that inflicted this defect. The lower dark triangular um, defect is what is consistent with a single puncture wound, probably of the lower left canine tooth. And it is triangularly shaped because the dog and the victim's body part were at that moment moving in opposite directions. That is a very recognizable uh, puncture with a slight tear that is typically caused by, again, movement of the biter and the bite E away from each other. This is a minor wound. It's a single puncture. Uh, the pattern to the top that we referred to before is the pressure pattern from the six incisors and one of the two canine teeth on the upper jaw. And because it is kind of directional from upper left to lower right, that indicates to me these are from teeth that were, again, withdrawing from the wound at the time it was afflicted, or at least from the person's body, um, body part. Okay. Uh, you've had conversations with Karen May? Yes. Okay, and, and your understanding is that perhaps the um, the dogs may have been startled that they didn't necessarily see their target until um, until they came around a, a hedge. Can you tell yes, us? That is my okay. You, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Um, so, 
Can you tell us, in terms of, have you testified in Massachusetts about dangerous dogs before in court? Yes, I have, several times. So you're familiar with the Massachusetts statute? You said you read it before the hearing, right? Yes, I did. Okay. So, uh, in your opinion, we're looking to see whether these dogs are a nuisance dog or a dangerous dog. So, uh, can you tell us what your opinion is of that and, and why? In, focus on the, the fact that neither get, neither dog fully engaged here the way a dangerous dog would. Yes, the uh, according to the statute, and I'm looking at it now to refresh my memory, as uh, provided under statute, these dogs would at most appear to be nuisance dogs. There was no severe injury inflicted. These are both minor bites. These were single engagements. These were bites that were, frankly, uh, controlled and moderated by the, by the dogs. Either one of them could have done much more damage. And the fact that both the person bitten and the dog's owner and the dogs were startled um, informs me that this was a, a quick again, startle reaction. The bites are consistent with, um, to, to, to give a slight expansion, dogs don't have hands, so they use their teeth for everything, manipulation, eating, carrying their babies, everything they do. Um, these bites are both consistent with a dog, a normal dog using their teeth to warn somebody that they are somehow uncomfortable and they wish to gain space from the person to whom the bite is, or the, the contact with the teeth is directed. This is an, it, it, these are both attempts to gain space and to alleviate the anxiety or fear that's been caused by the startles. These again are moderated, they are proportionate and normal for a dog that is startled. Um, and I will, again, based on my, my reading of the statute, I would say, yeah, they're probably technically a nuisance dog, but they're definitely, this is definitely not the behavior I would expect from or hold to the standard of being dangerous. Uh, and just to wrap it up, uh, with no priors on these dogs, and no, then never having escaped a yard or a fenced-in enclosure, or even from the owners. Um, under Massachusetts law, we're looking to see if the dog's reaction was not grossly disproportionate uh, to this circumstance. Was the dog, or either dog, protecting or defending itself, its offspring, or person from attack or assault? And that would be a nuisance dog. The statute says you can't name that a dangerous dog. In these dogs' minds, are they in a protective mode there? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. object um, to that question. That is a very <laughs> likely scenario. Understand Hold that on one second, sir. for a dog to go. Hold on, we're okay. going to. I'm changing the question. You go with that question. <laughs> Although you and I both know that what the dog's intent here was, can you tell us what you think the dog's well, intent was? Mr. Chair. What That's was. Based on, just tell us what you think the dog's intent was. Okay. Again, it's That's kind of. I don't think you can speak to a dog's intent. I can speak to the purpose based on research and experience. That wasn't the question. It is now? <laughs> okay, can, may I answer or are we uh, Here's the question, Jim. Uh, what's the likelihood, are these dogs dangerous? No, they do not meet the standards set by Massachusetts law as dangerous, nor does their behavior in this incident rise to a level that I would call disproportionate or um, what was, I, I don't remember exactly how you put it, but this was not a disproportionate or dangerous response. This was a normal, proportionate, and actually quite measured and controlled response to a startle reaction that is consistent with a dog that is suddenly uh, approached by something it perceives 
as a possible threat, and it doesn't mean it's a real threat, and that it acts in um, consistent with protecting itself or and or its owners from an unknown person or object. Okay. Uh, so, if it is a nuisance, we agree that things ha still things can change. She can be a better manager of the dogs tomorrow than she is today. Uh, after talking to her, what are some of the things you suggest that you think would uh, improve the situation here so it doesn't happen again? I would suggest um, the positive measures of A, seeking additional training so that the dogs are under more reliable voice and leash control. Uh, I would suggest as part of that training, the socialization or exposure of those dogs to new and or uh, different people and circumstances be increased so that they will be less likely to perceive pretty much anybody or anything as a potential threat. Uh, I would suggest that the dogs only be walked one at a time in order to uh, um, allow the owner to devote their full attention to each of the dogs. If they're going to be walked together, then I would suggest that two competent, healthy adults each have one dog apiece. Um, the training can be quantified by the dogs being um, uh, examined for and qualified under the American Kennel Club's Canine Good Citizen Program. That's a situation that tests not only whether the dog is of stable temperament, but whether the dogs have received basic training from their owner as it involves walking on a leash, walking through a crowd of people, walking by other dogs, and uh, they are not allowed to show any aggressive or startle response during that examination. Uh, I think a reasonable period of time to achieve that with training assistance would be six months or less. Um, those, I think, are the, probably the most uh, important uh, things I would recommend doing with these dogs. Okay, so the last thing you said is the AKC CGC, Certified Good Citizen, uh, Good Citizen. Yes. Can, can you just very briefly tell us that, how that test is recognized, the fact that only certain people can administer the test, and the involvement level of the owner for these 12 tests that the dogs have to go through? Yes, the test has been established and recognized, I believe, um, it was established by a friend of mine, Dr. Mary Birch, I believe back in the late 60s, early 70s. And the test is designed to uh, examine two things. Number one, the underlying temperament, the, the, the nature of the dog, and secondly, the involvement and responsibility of the owner in doing basic training. It's not up to an obedience type, but it, to pass it, the owner must put in time, effort, and understanding to be able to pass through the 12 tests. And those tests, of course, uh, involve walking on a leash, uh, coming when called, staying on command, uh, being pet, petted, it's an awkward word, um, being handled, uh, being brushed, uh, being exposed deliberately to a startling stimulus such as suddenly opening an umbrella or dropping an object and making a loud noise. Um, and again, uh, walking through a crowd of people, walking up to and meeting and greeting another person with a control dog. Um, all of these are parts of the test. The test is, is prescribed in not only order but in particular directions. And to administer such a test, you have to um, go through the testing materials, you have to take a written exam, and you have to be approved by the Canine Good Citizen section of the American Kennel Club before you're allowed to administer these tests. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I don't have anything further for you, Jim, but others might. OK. 
Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I have a couple questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, can you hear me, Mr. Crosby? Yes, I can right now. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to talk from here, but if you can't hear me, I'll, I'll move closer. Um, okay. Okay, so first off, you haven't um, personally examined either of these dogs, correct? I have not physically met either dog, no. COVID's made that impossible. And, and so your, your opinion is based solely on the description of the incident um, and the documents and photos that you've reviewed, correct? Correct. The descriptions, the documents, the photos, <coughs> yes. Okay. Now, um, you testified concerning the, um, the severity of the bite um, to the foot. And you, you describe this as a, a level three bite under the Dunbar scale, which is one to four punctures from a single bite with no puncture deeper than half the length of the dog's canine teeth. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. But there were, in fact, two bites um, to the foot here. Um, right? I right. have no evidence that indicates that because the position that they could be or that they appear to be could potentially have been from a dog opening its mouth pretty wide so so the the dog in one single bite would have or could have bitten the top of the foot and the ankle uh sure if it's a pretty good sized dog and that's my understanding is he's a pretty good sized dog if not if we were to presume that this was more than a single bite then it would be a level three d which is multiple bites at a level three. It still does not uh, increase the level from a three. It's just simply a three B. Okay, and so then the difference between a level three bite and a level four bite is based on the depth of the puncture wound, correct? No, it's based on the depth of the puncture wound, the number of holes that are involved, the uh, description also details to expect deep muscle bruising uh, and further injuries just on itself. A level four does not strictly depend on the depth. To read from the description, uh, it's a single bite with at least one puncture deeper than half the length of the dog's canine tooth. It may also have deep bruising around the wound uh, where the dog held on and bore down or lacerations in both directions where the dog held on and shook its head from side to side. Okay, and so um, you looked at the picture here um, of the, the top of the, the victim's foot, correct? Yes. And we see a one puncture wound there. Yes. And, and then we see a, a much larger wound next to it and above it um, that um, considerably like bruising, don't they? I see some some surface dark uh, purplish bruising surrounding a darker section, which would the darker section would be the puncture wound. So there is some shallow bruising. That means that uh, there has been a gathering of some blood under the top few layers of skin. And it, it's shallow here, uh, but. The, the victim was wearing a sneaker, wasn't she? That is what the statement says, yes. Yeah, so doesn't it stand to reason that this injury would have been significantly more severe if she was not wearing a sneaker? Um, not necessarily. It depends on where on the sneaker the, uh, the tooth hit, how thick the material of the sneaker was. There's a lot of difference between a pair of light running shoes like I would use for running a marathon versus the, the heavier uh, uh, sneakers that are still boots that I would wear when dealing with a, a potential biting dog. So then it's your, your opinion that a bite that goes through a sneaker and into a person's skin and that also causes bruising in the area is still only a level three bite. Based on the criteria, yes, this is a level three bite. Bruising varies from human to human, and it's very common around 
dog bites, even very shallow bites. Since this person did not report, and there's been no allegation documentation of any ligaments, tendons, or, or skeletal damage below the bite, it would seem to meet the criteria of being less than half the depth of a canine tooth. And even if you add in the thickness of the sneaker, I doubt that her sneakers were uh, the by themselves were half the length of the canine tooth. Okay, but you don't know that. I have not seen any documentation on just how thin the sneakers were. And you haven't seen any documentation on how long the dog's teeth were? No, uh, those that I'm having to project simply uh, from the uh, general size um, that I have been uh, explained that neither one of these, for instance, are 150 pound Great Dane, nor are we talking of Chihuahua. Did, did you, do you have photos of the, the dogs? I have not had photos of the dogs. So you haven't seen the dogs? No, I haven't. Okay, so you haven't seen the they dogs. Haven't. You don't know how long their teeth are. You haven't seen the sneaker. You don't know how thick the sneaker was. But what you can see is that the dog caused an injury that went through the sneaker and into the skin. And it's your position that that is not a severe injury. Yeah, it's my, it's my opinion that that is a minor bite, which is consistent with if we presume the other one is also a separate bite or together, um, that that one is very clearly above where the sneaker would be. So unless she was wearing boots, uh, that is also a very light engagement. But that makes it two bites. So that takes it out of level three, doesn't it? No, that makes it a level 3B. Well, I don't it's see a level 3B in your um, description that you gave us. Um, well, that's an, that's an older copy of it. Dr. Dunbar has um, published an addition to that. Plus, Dr. Dunbar and I have had uh, many personal discussions over the scale. Um, in fact, assisting the Maddie's Shelter Medicine uh, folks in reworking the scale with Dr. Dunbar's cooperation, and he has established that there is a 3B, which is more than one bite at a level three. But you didn't give us that part of the scale, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, there, there's a couple of different copies of the floating around. Um, I thought I had sent the uh, most recent, but uh, the, the 3B is part of the, the current and most the last probably two to three years uh, versions that Dr. Limbar is teaching. <clears throat> now, you also testified earlier that you're, you're familiar with the, the definition um, of dangerous dog under Massachusetts law. Yes, I'm looking at the statute uh, right now. Okay, and so then can you show, um, read for the board where in that definition it says that um, a dog is only a dangerous dog if it causes severe injury? Uh, I don't believe that the Massachusetts law actually includes that. I simply mentioned that because uh, that a severe injury, in my mind, would automatically uh, put us well over the threshold into considering a dog dangerous. Um, so, in other words, if the dog ripped the person's arms off or, or something like that, I would pretty much disregard the minor parts of the statute. Uh, this is not a severe wound on either case. Um, okay, and so, but the definition itself doesn't say that it needs to be that serious of an injury. It just says causing physical injury. Correct. It just simply says um, it, it does not detail the level of injury necessary. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have nothing further. Uh, members of the board, do you have any questions? No. I just have a follow up if you guys don't have questions. I have, uh, no questions. I have questions. Do you, Mr. Bizanis? No. no. Okay. Um, I'd like to know the weight size. How big are these dogs? Um, just to get an okay. idea how big they are. I'm sorry, so through you, Mr. Chair, just procedurally before we move on, 
I'd like to give the complainant an opportunity to ask this witness any questions. Uh, if the attorney has a follow-up question, maybe we should go with him first okay. and go. Okay. Uh, just to address your question, Cinnamon, 44 pounds, Murphy, 70 pounds. Thank you. Jim, uh, when you first got this case, right, you took a look at the local bylaws, is that right? Yes, I did. Yes, and I did. and uh, one thing you said to my client is that pit bulls are not allowed in the town, right? That is was part of their is part of their code. Yes. Okay. So, um, Mr. Chair, through you, I'm going to object to that. We're not proceeding under the town's bylaw. We're proceeding under the the general laws. There's no suggestion here that this dog is not allowed in the town because no. it's a it's a pit bull and. Notwithstanding what the bylaw might say, that bylaw has not been updated since the law was changed recently. Now it's done. In, is this your first case testifying where you haven't been face to face with with anybody or haven't met the dogs physically? No, there there have been a number of cases across the country and in fact as far as India where I've been asked to uh, uh, evaluate physical evidence and statements and so forth because in some of the cases uh, frankly the dogs um, are simply not available okay in some cases they've been put down or whatever okay now as somebody who trains animal control officers and you were an animal control officer the questions you've been asked about tooth depth and, and looking at a sneaker or medical bills that we haven't had, is that anything that the animal control officer could have done at the time of his investigation? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, you want to allow that? Yes, um, to, to the complainants, do you have any questions? No. Yeah. Members of the board, anything? Um, back to the bylaw. Um, the bylaws have not been updated, and I don't believe that if it is in there that's saying we don't allow pit bulls in town, I don't believe it's legal anyway. And, and I, I don't remember that ever being in there. I know several years ago we tried to put in a bylaw saying that they'd have to have a muzzle if they were walking, but I don't believe pit bulls are illegal in, Mass in uh, Abington. Um, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, the law was significantly changed in 2012, and, and one of the provisions of the new state law is that a municipality cannot ban a dog based solely on its breed. Correct. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that this bylaw has not been updated since 2012, it's my opinion that it, that provision would be in conflict with state law and would not be enforceable and which is why when we sent the notice of this proceeding we only made reference to the provisions of the general laws and it's my recommendation that when you proceed to your decision that you only apply the law um, under the general laws without regard to what the bylaw may or may not say at this point okay. so our last witness will be Karen Mitt. Hi, my name is Karen May and I'm the owner of the dogs. Hang on one second. Yes. Um, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Just quickly for the record, your address. 44 Cleverly Street. And one more thing. Matt, this microphone is working fine? It is? Okay, thank you. Um, so, since the get-go, at the very first instance when this happened, I have been nothing but very sorry that this happened. I called Gail at, I think it was a little bit after 8 in the morning, you know, right after it happened, to check on her. Um, I offered to pay for any medical bills. I followed up with numerous calls to her. Um, both I and the dogs were startled. We both came around the hedges. I never said hello to her. I was holding leashes, and when I was switching leashes around, because I had two dogs, you know, Murphy was startled. 
he get out of my hand. You know, I immediately grabbed him. Cinnamon never became off, came off leash. Just when I was grabbing Murphy, he was that close to Gail, she fell down. Um, you know, we we when we um, got the quarantine, both dogs are quarantined. We just quarantined them both at the same time. Every time we took them out, we've muzzled Murphy. We have them on leashes. I don't tie them out in the yard. Um, I haven't since this instance, and I don't plan on it. Um, the dogs prefer to be in the house anyways. Um, when they are out with an adult, they're on a leash and muzzled. Um, and that's what we've been doing since the get-go, since this instance. I'm very sorry. I've been nothing but contrite and trying to do what the Bergens have asked and also just to do the right neighborly thing. And, um, you know, the dogs are on six-foot leashes. We're going to do one at a time, and we'll do additional training. Um, I don't know what else further I could do. Three minutes to through you, Mr. Chair, but just a few questions. Yeah, um, So, on the, um, how long have you had Murphy? Probably about a year and a half to two years. And how old is Murphy? Um, he's three. And um, how much does Murphy weigh? I'd say a little over 70 pounds. He's about this high. I don't know how you know, big that would be. And um, how did you acquire Murphy? Um, he's my son's girlfriend's dog. And has Murphy been licensed the entire time you've had him? Um, I think so, yes. And has he ever gone through any type of training? Yes. What type of training? Um, he went to Canine College in Holbrook, and um, Michaela took him a couple of times. I'm sorry, who's Michaela? Uh, my son's girlfriend. Oh. And um, has um, Murphy ever bitten anybody before? Not to my knowledge. And how often do you... Um, Prior to this incident, how often would you walk Murphy in the neighborhood? Oh, well, I walk him in the morning and at night. Every day? Every day, yeah. yes. And um, has he ever acted like this before? As far as, well, no, no, I've, I've not happened, had this happen before, no. And, um, I mean, has he had any... Um, Previous interactions with Miss Bergen? No, I think just when he's been out, you know, we've seen them walking by, but he's never met her. And in those other occasions when you've seen her walking by, how has he reacted to her? Um, well, sometimes I think he barks when people go by our house, you know. But he's never before gone after her while you were walking along the leash? No. Um, and has anything like this happened since? Um, well, the second occurrence that she referred to, I was in my own yard, and the, they just drove down in their car down the street, and you know they beeped the horn. I was startled. My back was to the to the road. The dogs were both with me on leashes, and I was startled. The dogs were startled, and both of the dogs ran to the end of their leashes. But that's all that happened. And they barked. That's what dogs do. Okay, and um, who else lives in the, well, not who else, but are there other adults that live in the household besides you? Yes, my husband and my son. And um, if the, the board here, you know, were to issue um, an order that that you have to impose conditions on restraint of the dog, um, what would you be willing to do in order to um, try to ensure that this doesn't happen again? I'd be willing to muzzle them and, and um, you 
and then I don't put them out on a run, and there's always an adult that walks them. Take training. Um, you heard Mr. Um, Crosby talk about the Canine Good Citizen program. Are you willing to do that? Yes. For both of the dogs? So um, I'll agree to that only if I don't muzzle them, taking them to the canine good citizenship. Why is that? The reason is that there's nothing more secure than the muzzle. So if you pin a muzzle on these dogs that have these minor bites, there's no need to go through all the training because the muzzle is the most effective thing you can do besides killing the dog. And for these types of bites, that, that would be overkill training and muzzle. Anything else that you'd be willing to do? Members of the board, do you have any questions? I do. Um, you, you mentioned that you have tried to do whatever the very months passed since then. What did they ask? Um, they asked me not to bring the dogs down the end of Morton Street Extension near their home. And I, I have, have tried to avoid being on Morton Street Extension, even though it's the side of my house and the access from my driveway, but I'm, you know, bringing the dogs around the other side the house to the backyard. Okay, so if we added that to the order, you'd be okay with that? Yes. And um, you mentioned the, the dog had gone to the canine calls in over a couple of times. Yes. Um, did they complete any classes? Is there any certificate, certification? He did complete classes, but I don't know exactly what they were. Okay. My other dog had went there as well. Is that, uh, are they still in business? Yes. I don't know, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, how are the dogs around kids and are there children in the house or there's no children in the house do they no. go for a ride and go to a park or anything like that or, um, or are they really just house dogs they're really just house dogs okay All right. um, and how, how big is the other dog Cinnamon is 44 pounds. 44, and what make, what, what make? She's a hound dog mix. Hound, okay. Yeah. I don't know with what. And how old is Cinnamon? She's seven. Seven. And how did you obtain her? Um, I went to an, an adoption event. Okay. I got her when she was, um, I think, eight weeks old. Okay. Um, I have no other questions right now. until they receive their CGC, that's that's fair. So until they pass these 12, I think that's, that's what you're asking. Right. Right. Until oh. they pass it, would you agree to Muslim dogs until they oh, pass it? Oh, yes. Um, uh, just one thing, uh, just for your own benefit, um, <coughs> I would, if I were you, if this board, you know, sees fit, I would look into that. I don't know if I would commit that you're going to, it sounds like a big task. Um, so, I mean, I have dogs, uh, a dog, uh, I've, uh, I have rescue dogs. Um, 
uh, and I'm not minimizing your incident. My wife was bitten by a dog when she was a kid. She was bitten by a dog here in Abington a few years ago, walking into a friend's house. Um, we never called you, Joe. Um, but I, I understand the trauma. But I, thinking about that and thinking about my dog, I'm not sure my dog could do that. So I would just be careful, you know, I think requiring that maybe or committing to that if I were you. So just my opinion. Yeah. Anything further from members of the board? Uh, Attorney Cohen, anything further from your side? No. <laughs> Attorney Cohen, do you want to give a summary of the board before we um, close the evidentiary portion of the hearing? Uh, you've, you've given us quite a bit of time. I think um, I'm not going to take up more time with that. I just ask that uh, she wants to be reasonable, that she be reasonable, and um, She's going to take every step she can to make sure this doesn't happen again. Anything further from the Burgess? No. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so now we'll we'll enter the, the final phase of this hearing. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you have two tasks in front of you. Um, the first is whether you, you find that these dogs are uh, nuisance dogs or dangerous dogs as those terms are defined in the law, and I'll, I'll give you both of those definitions in a moment. Um, so you can vote yes or no. If you vote no, that they're not either nuisance or dangerous dogs, then um, the night has concluded and there's no nothing further to do. If, however, you do find that they are nuisance or dangerous dogs, then you have to address a second question which is what, if any, remedy should be imposed to um, abate the dangerousness or the nuisance. Um, now, uh, with all due respect to, to Mr. Uh, Crosby, you know, the, the determination of whether or not these dogs are nuisance dogs or dangerous dogs is yours to make um, based on, on the facts as you've heard them. Um, you can certainly take into account his um, experience and opinions um, and, and give them whatever weight you, you deem appropriate but it is your decision at the end of the day. Um, so I, I'll go through each of the two definitions and then um, I, I would suggest that, that you discuss that question first and then we can move on to the question of remedy. Okay, so um, the first definition is a dangerous dog. A dog that either, one, without justification, attacks a person or domestic animal causing physical injury or death, or two, behaves in a manner that a reasonable person would believe poses an unjustified imminent threat of physical injury or death to a person or to a domestically owned animal. Okay, so there's two elements here. The first is um, an, an attack on either a person or a domestic animal. Um, which we have here, causing physical injury, which we have here, um, and without justification, which I think is, is disputed. Um, Ms. Bergen would testify that she was doing nothing other than walking in her own neighborhood, um, and she was um, surprise attacked by these dogs. Um, on, the, on the other side, um, Ms. May would say that the dogs were startled and reacted um, to being startled. So uh, that's a question that, that you're going to have to, to face. The other part of this is that the, the dog behaves in a manner that a reasonable person would believe poses an imminent threat of physical injury. So this is uh, an instance in which the dog acts in an aggressive way but does not necessarily attack or bite someone. Um, Excuse me, Craig, you yeah. got a word? I'm sorry. Justified? Imminent threat? Yes, an unjustified imminent threat. Um, I'm not sure that this really applies here because if you're going to find it's dangerous, my um, opinion would be that it would fall under the first category rather than the second. Um, with respect to dangerousness, there are a few exceptions that the dog was protecting itself, its offspring, or another animal or person from attack. 
the person attacked or threatened was committing a crime upon the person or property of the owner, the person attacked or threatened was te teasing or otherwise provoking the dog, or at the time of the attack or threat, the person or animal attacked or threatened had breached an enclosure or structure in which the dog was kept apart from the public. So if you find any of those circumstances, then the dog cannot be considered dangerous. Okay. So now I'll move on to, to nuisance. And again, we can go over, over all of this again. Um, a nuisance dog is one that um, causes a source of annoyance to a sick person through excessive barking or other disturbance. That doesn't apply here. Um, by excessive barking causing damage or other interference, a reasonable person would find such behavior disruptive to one's quiet and peaceful enjoyment or has threatened or attacked livestock, a domestic animal or person, but such threat or attack was not grossly disproportionate reaction under the circumstances. So the difference between a dangerous dog and a nuisance dog with respect to an attack is that a dangerous dog is one who attacks without any justification and causes physical injury or death, whereas a nuisance dog might have threatened or attacked, um, but that attack was not a grossly disproportionate reaction under the circumstances. Um, so it's, it's somewhat a, a level of degree. And what you've heard here again is that, um, you know, the dog may have been reacting to being startled. And so what you have to, to face, in my opinion, is was the dog's reaction to that circumstance unreasonable? I think if you find that the dog did act unreasonably, then it's a dangerous dog. If you find that it acted reasonably, then you can find it's a nuisance dog. So I know I've given you a lot. I'll stop for a minute and let you ponder and ask questions. And no matter what we decide, nuisance or dangerous, the, the outcome, the resolution, same. There's no like minimum resolution for a dangerous dog. So, um, if you find that it's a dangerous dog, then the statute sets forth um, a menu of options that you can um, adopt to either um, restrain the dog or protect the public from the dog, or ultimately to euthanize the dog. Um, if it's a nuisance dog, it's more open-ended. However, I would suggest that if you find that it's a nuisance dog, um, it would not be in order um, to order that the dog be euthanized. I think that would, would not necessarily stand up for a nuisance dog. So I guess to the board, this no, the question is whether the dog's acted in a reasonable manner, consider what happened. Well, what it, it appears, and it's my opinion, that the dogs were startled. And um, uh, Joe has never had a complaint on these dogs before or since. So in my opinion, it's not a dang they're not dangerous dogs. Um, I would like to uh, maybe declare them a nuisance dog at this point and with some restrictions um, but I'll listen to the rest of them. I'd like to have that stricken from the record. <laughs> <laughs>
to be startled like that and to attack through you know, through a shoe in that manner. And it seems a lot. Especially when you're on a leash with your owner. But then I also, you know, and I, again, I'm not an expert at all, but from the training I've done with my dog and, you know, the research I've done, I, I do understand that there's the pack mentality too, where the, if it's more than one dog, sometimes they get each other going. Um, yeah. Well, how about if we um, did a nuisance dog with uh, some of these restrictions that um, the dogs would have to be walked with the muzzle, first of all, and only one dog at a time with a four-foot leash so that the owner would have control of the dog. And um, they must be muzzled when they're outside no unsupervised, unsupervised dogs outside on a run or a leash or anything unless there's an adult out there with them. And if you are going to put the dogs outside, I would suggest a, a kennel that you could put the dogs in. And if you were going to go for the uh, good citizen, um, that would even be better or maybe some more training. Um, I was the animal control officer in Abington uh, years ago, long before Joe was, and I've seen, um, I saw a couple of dog bites. Uh, it never got to this point. It was resolved with the uh, residents. But um, I just hate to uh, label a dog a dangerous dog when it's in the three or four years for one and seven years for the other, this is the first incident. So um, I'd be in favor of uh, calling it a nuisance dog with restrictions. Mr. Chair, um, through you to um, you and, and Mike, um, if it would help sort of break the log jam here. Um, you know, sometimes when we, um, when we talk about um, other types of discipline, like liquor licensing or employee discipline, we talk about progressive discipline right so you start off with something um lower and, and you work your way up if additional incidents occur um so maybe you could think about this distinction between nuisance and dangerous like that and and certainly if something were to happen again in the future you know this incident would would be of record this hearing would be of record and you would right. start from okay now this is our second time that we're here um, and, and, you know, you could factor that into your analysis. But here, you know, where these dogs have been owned on this property for a number of years, this is the first time that it's happened. And, you know, the dogs were not running loose and unattended at the time that the incident occurred. Um, it does, you know, seem like it was an unfortunate accident that the owner was trying to keep proper control um, and, you know, something unexpected happened, which, which could happen any time with dogs. And, you know, it certainly doesn't, doesn't justify um, a, a dog biting someone. Um, but, you know, I think under these circumstances and given progressive discipline, it might make sense to start at nuisance and then work your way up in the future if you have to. Yeah, I mean, I personally don't want to get hung up on the word nuisance or dangerous. Either way, what I'm concerned about is the end result. That this doesn't happen again, whether we name it nuisance or dangerous, won't take away the fact that it did happen, won't take away the fear Mrs. Bergen had that day. And, uh, you know, but what we can do is fix what's going forward. Hopefully, I like all Alex's recommendations. I would ask also that you refrain from walking in front of um, the Bergen's residence out of the spire. And I know that's tough. You guys are still neighbors and still very neighbors. Mr. Gordon. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> totally um, just, just in aspect of the, uh, what type of liability will the town have? God forbid something. And I, you know, I do. I completely agree with progressive discipline that sort of thing. But God forbid, second time is. And I'm not saying it's going to happen. But what kind of liability falls on us? 
uh, Mr. Chair, through you. In my experience and, and opinion, um, the, the likelihood of liability on the town is little to nothing. Okay. Um, obviously, I can never guarantee any sort of sort of result, but um, there are specific immunities in the law um, under Chapter 258, um, Section 10 of the general laws. Um, the town cannot be held liable for um, injuries caused by um, third persons that you do not control. Um, you cannot be um, held liable for failing or refusing to take enforcement action. That there are a number of, of defenses that you could assert, um, and you know the, the primary liability would fall on the dog. Yeah. <coughs> so with that, I would um, make a motion that this dog be dog be these dogs be classified as nuisance nuisance dogs. When they are outside of the house, they must be on a leash no longer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just to town council, should we do this in two separate motions? I would suggest you do it in two okay. separate. I think it will be easier that way. So, so we do uh, 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 to make it a nuisance dog. Okay. And then we do restrictions yes. or, or whatever we want to so, do. Okay. So your motion is to declare that both dogs nuisance dogs. Correct. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor of labeling the dogs nuisance dogs, say aye. 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 The board's unanimous. Okay, so now with respect to this, this finding of nuisance, um, the statute does not contain any specific guidance as to what, what you can order, um, but it's a, a reasonableness standard. So what conditions do you reasonably believe will um, what's the word, um, mitigate the nuisance. Um, so in order to protect public safety, what conditions do you think are reasonably necessary to impose? So we could um, require um, well, I'm hung up on muzzling both dogs. Both dogs are not muzzled now, correct? Just the pit bull. Just the big one. The, the little one doesn't walk on a muzzle. She just freezes and won't move. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to make it so difficult that, you know, she can't go outside with the dogs either. And uh, I, again, I'm not minimizing your trauma whatsoever, um, but we're just trying to be reasonable here. And um, I would say that um, the bigger dog should be muzzled um, when outside, walked on a leash no longer than four feet. And if it's tied up in the yard on a run, there needs to be an adult supervising. I would suggest maybe trying to get uh, some more training, if you could, and if you could get the Good Citizen Award, that would be great too, but uh, that's a tall order, so that, that's not part of it, but uh, it would be the muzzle, the big dog, a leash of uh, four, uh, not exceeding four feet, and the dogs are not to be outside on a run unless they're supervised by an adult. Those are my three issues. I would add too that the dogs be walked by one adult per dog. Yes. We'll walk walking both dogs at the same time, like we have been doing anyway. Um, I make that part of the order, and also to not to walk in front of the Bergen's residence. Correct. I'm for the good citizen school extra training. I feel like the muzzle is a short term, um, it's not really stopping the dog's behavior, it's preventing him from acting out. Mm -hmm. um, so I too would like to see some sort of uh, the good citizen program from completion by both dogs. I know it's a tall order and you know, we can't make you, you act a good faith, you know. Well, we could require that 
they have training, but not necessarily yeah. complete the good dog thing. Uh, being a dog owner myself, my dog would never pass that. It just, it's not going to happen. So I think that is a tall order, although my dog could react well to training. So I, I, I would prefer not to put a label on the training, but I would like to see more training also. And if you've been to Canine College, uh, that's where my dog was, I think that's maybe where you should continue. Read it back, sure, um, Mr. Chair. Okay, so um, Murphy only muzzled when outside at all times. Correct. Um, both dogs um, walked on a leash no longer than four feet. Correct. Um, both dogs, if tied up in the yard, um, must be under adult supervision. Correct. Um, the dogs may only be walked by one adult. Um, per dog. Correct. Um, the dogs may not be walked in front of the Bergen residence. Correct. And the dog shall undergo training um, of the owner's choice. Is there an accreditation? Like, like we went to school, like an accredited school. I mean, I, I hate to say the owner's choice. Can I talk? Can I? Yeah, yeah uh, Joe. What? Please. All right, so Joe Kenny, Animal Patrol again. Um, I'm not a dog trainer. I do know a lot of people that are dog trainers, um, as well as people that administer the good citizenship test. Um, it's a difficult test. Um, it's, in most cases, doesn't get passed on the first time. And personally, I've seen a lot of dogs that are great with the test. Um, take longer than six months. I think it's a really long course. Um, I think having a muzzle on the dogs is, it's not a long-term fix, it's not changing a behavior, but it's preventing them from doing anything. So to put in like a restriction of trying to long-term fix the dog, um, I think is more difficult than being able to prevent something from happening. Um, in my opinion, I think the muzzle is going to do more than training um, as a long-term fix because it, even with training, um, I know dogs that have been trained as therapy dogs or dogs that are trained as like um, companion dogs and stuff like that that are allowed in stores and they still bite people. Um, it still happens. It's an animal. If it has a muzzle on, it can't bite. Um, that eliminates that process and it eliminates a variable. Um, whether the dog does a pass and then we end up back here in six months because it hasn't passed a training, um, it's gonna eliminate that in the long run. Um, I also think it's difficult to say like, um, and I'm only saying this because I've been out to the properties, it is difficult to say to avoid walking in front of the house. I mean, down the road, yes, I see. But um, the driveways are more or less adjacent to each other. So it is a really difficult situation to put that stipulation in um, as a rule. Um, in other towns, I've seen a lot of these rules turn really gray. And then it becomes a problem down the line because we're going to get calls. So it's better to have rules that are like enforceable and physical, um, like your short leashes, your muzzles, stuff like that, that's not something that's a variable um, and that you can tangibly see and have evidence of. Um, I, that's all I have to say. Mr. Chair, through you. Oh, Mr. Joe. Yep. So if, um, 
trying to figure out how to phrase this. If if the owner were to um, come to you with um, the training program that they intend to use, would you be able to give an opinion and say, yes, I think that's a, a legitimate program, or no, I don't think that's I'll be, a be honest with you guys, I can give you an opinion, but I have no background to say my opinion matters. Um, only only um, to the extent that you know to my extent, who the trainers are. Yes, I do know trainers, and I know that there's certifications that are going to give you more credit for the dog. Um, but the only thing I like to say with that is it's a very variable thing. Um, I know dogs that have passed and have had bites. I know dogs that have passed and been great. I know dogs that don't pass because they're just too active, they're energetic, and they're great dogs. So I, I think those tests are very tangible to like specific dog versus to a, like a actual factual qualification. Um, I think it's a difficult thing to evaluate and down the line it might change. So um, I guess my question though is not so much that requiring that the dogs pass a certain test, but only that, that they be trained by someone with the appropriate credentials. Yeah. And so, you know, no, we're not guaranteeing any result yeah, that it's yeah. going to work or it's not, but that at least it's a good faith a, effort. Yeah, if it was like a good faith effort yeah. and they went to an accredited trainer, I think that's a reasonable requirement. I think putting something like a good citizenship or an actual test to it is a difficult thing. But having basic training, I think, is important with any pet ownership. Um, completing at least a basic training program, um, I think, is important with any any kind of pet ownership. So I would definitely be okay with that. And I think most dogs can compete, uh, complete that, teach just basic leash etiquette and stuff like that. I think that's a reasonable request as opposed to a good citizenship yeah. test. That's training they can get like that's to, yeah, canine college. There's a handful of trainers around here. You can do it with like 4-H. You can do it through Petco and PetSmart. Um, <coughs> it's a standardized program. But canine college is a really good, good school. It comes highly recommended. So, uh, Mr. Chair, through you, if we could. Um, Chain at the um, animal control officer's suggestion, um, eliminate the requirement that the dogs not be walked in front of the Bergen residents, and add a requirement that the dogs be trained by an accredited program approved by the animal control officer. So could you read that back again? Yes. Um, so the um, order would read um, that um, Murphy be muzzled any time that he is outdoors, um, that both dogs shall be walked on leashes no longer than four feet in length, that if the dogs are tied up in the yard or are otherwise outdoors, they shall be under adult supervision that the dogs shall only be walked by one adult per dog, and that the dogs shall be trained by an accredited program approved by the animal control officer. Okay. Somebody want to make that motion? So that was my motion. Uh, second, then. Any more discussion? favor of making that order? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Chair, the final order of business is just to close the vote. Oh, okay. So motion to, I'll accept the motion to close out the air. I'll make a motion to close the hearing. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor of closing the air say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. So this is a transfer. So what was the license before? Thirty-three. The existing license is fifteen. <coughs> excuse me, fifteen for repair, ten customer spaces, three employees for a total of fifteen, ten, and three. Does not equal to it. Well, 15 for repair, 10 for customer, and 3 employee comes to 28 by my math. But total number of cars on the existing license says 33. Any motion made by the board, I would expect to have the contingency that the application be changed to 33 total cars. This is, this, is, uh, this is Adam Street, right? No. no. Summer, Summer Street. No. Okay. This is the one across from the sewer building. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and actually, um, I would kind of like to see a new plan. And I'll tell you why. Because when that license was issued originally for 33 cars, there wasn't a solar field on that property. Now there's a solar field there also, and I'm not sure how they're fitting 33 cars in there. And typically we would have a plot plan showing the spaces with the application. And I'm not seeing one here. So I would like to continue this until we can get a plot plan showing where these 33 cars are going to go. Just my opinion. Yeah, motion. Well, according to this here, we got 42 spots. Hey, am I looking at the right thing here, Alex? I don't that. 42 spots with the measurements. I don't see that in my packet. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, here it is. Okay. And that's, sh that's showing you a lot more space for that many 
I'm sorry, I didn't see this in the packet. Even with the ground mount. Yeah. Is this uh, just a repair license? Or is it a used car lot also? No, it's just a commercial garage. Just a partial garage. Well, I would like to keep it at the 33. Just a commercial garage. They're not repairing 50 cars at once anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, if it's a transfer, if they won't, I mean, we should keep it the same. We had complaints in the past there. We haven't, uh, I'm not aware of any in the last few years, but um, there were complaints about uh, junk cars and. Uh, that was with the previous owner. I remember that yeah. when I first came on board that, that those were complaints, and then we had a, uh, either a transfer or a sale of this okay. business, and there's been no complaints since. Well, I, I'd make a motion to approve uh, with the change of 33 cars, not the 50. Yeah, which I don't even know if we consider that change, but I'll <coughs> approve, it, approve the license to transfer um, 33 cars. We just want to make sure that that doesn't change. So that motion is made. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of transferring the commercial garage license at 347 Summer Street Aye. Aye. Unanimous. This is transferred. Next up, the Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on August 24, 2020 at 750 in the Charter Hearing Room, 500 Clemens Way, the petition of Larissa de Silvera Rodriguez to transfer the Class 2 license at 766 Adam Street. From Ed McLaughlin, BBA Gas Mass Car Park, LLC to Panda Auto Group. Do we have somebody here to speak on this property? Uh, I'm the owner of Mass Car Park. Maybe I can answer any questions. Please just step up to the microphone, give you your name and address. My name is Ed McLaughlin. I live in uh, 499 Sherman Street, Canton, Massachusetts. And you're representing what business? I own Mass Car Park. Mass Car Park at 766 Adam Street, Abington, Mass. Thank you, and thank you for your patience. I know we're a little behind tonight. No problem. Um, there were some questions posed by the Deputy Fire Chief on this property. Are you aware of those? Um, yeah, there was some, on, the owner of the property had some, um, some, some things in the back of the property that the Fire Chief wanted him to square away, clean up, and appease him in the town. And uh, basically, I was aware of that, but I just wanted to show up and, uh, you know, um, I knew I was on the agenda tonight to answer any questions or just be on top of any other uh, issues that arise. So, I guess the first question is, are those, are those um, I guess they're drums of hazardous materials, have they been moved or disposed of properly, or are they still there? Oh, I uh, I don't know what is in the drums. I don't know if that I don't know what it was. However, um, I'm not gonna. I don't know if they're still there because I know that the town still has to talk to the landlord on that okay. stuff, and um, I, I don't know where they're at. So I'm gonna let the town, and I think uh, the uh, marshal, I believe, is for. Uh, no, I forget the department. Marshal's the building. The uh, building department. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, handle that because it's not you know i'm just going to sell the license okay. i'm just a renter there and i don't own the property so yeah, not but speaking for the board but I, probably what we're going to do is continue this hearing correct right? that's what i was aware i was aware of it i just wanted to make sure that i'm on top of everything <laughs> right. so if anybody's ready to make a motion i make a motion to continue the hearing until we hear back from is it the deputy chief? Before you do that, I'm sorry, I don't believe I opened this meeting. Oh. Um, so let, I'll accept a motion to open the public hearing. I'm sorry. Make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. The hearing is open. Um, so go ahead. 
you should you should motion it to a date certain. So I would motion it to the fourteenth and then okay. if we don't have enough information then we'll then we continue it. continue it then. Yeah. So I'd uh, move to um, move this hearing to September 14th uh, at a time to be determined by the town manager. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, continue the meeting until September 14th. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing will be continued. Any opposed? Aye. What's that? Thanks, Thank guys. Very much. Have a good night. Thanks. 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 Yep. One more motion. Adjourn. I'll second. second. Uh, no, Mike second. Sorry. <laughs> All those in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you very much.